Welcome to worship on this third Sunday of Easter as we search for life in the midst of death, hope in the midst of despair. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, and no matter what you're witnessing in the news or in your own life, you are welcome here. Our opening verses this week come from Robert L. Brawl, first of all. The empty tomb does not explain Jesus' resurrection. Jesus' resurrection explains it. And this from Sarah Henrik. It is very good news that Jesus does not give up helping his followers come to an understanding. I invite you to join me as we recall the presence of God in silence and then sing our opening song. Please join me in our opening prayer. God of many names, we gather today having bore witness to more pain against another of your beloved children. As we gather together, we feel countless things, rage, fear, frustration, weariness, hopelessness, guilt, and heavy, heavy sorrow. In all of the emotions and the thoughts that were inside us, help us to be present within them and stir us from our complacency and guide us to action so that your abundant love and grace might touch everyone we encounter. In your name we pray. Amen. Now I invite you to a time of passing the peace of Christ to one another, and I do hope that you feel a sense of peace this morning. Peace and blessings, my friends. I want to invite any children who are in the room to come closer to the computer screen or any adults who are especially curious today because I want to explore with you for a few minutes what Jesus was like after the resurrection. I've always wondered what it would have been like to witness what was going on. His friends recognized him. 
At least in this story they did. But somehow he was different, changed. He could appear inside a locked room, kind of like makes me think of ghost stories where ghosts go through walls. But Jesus wasn't a ghost. He says he's not a ghost in this story. They could also touch him, even touch the wounds in the palm of his hands, or even put their hands into his wounded side. Ick. He could eat a piece of fish. His body was new and different, but he was also the same old Jesus that they had known. It was very mysterious. And it still is mysterious for us today. No one completely understands it. They, they're having a talk with somebody who came back from the dead. I wonder what else they talked about and what else they did together. I mean the stuff that isn't written down in our scripture reading today. Will you pray with me as we continue to wonder? Let us pray. God, Jesus came back to life after being dead, and that's hard for us to understand. Help us to be curious and ask somehow about everything. Ask questions about all that we see and all that we hear, wanting to know more. And help us to keep looking for answers. And also to become comfortable with the fact that some things are a mystery. That we may know a lot, but we may not completely understand, no matter how much we know. And thank you, God, for the ability to wonder about these things and about life and about you. Amen. A reading from Luke 24, verses 36b through 48. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning with Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. There ends the reading. Bystander. Noun. A person who is present at an event or incident but does not take part. Witness. Noun. A person who sees an event, typically a crime or accident, take place. These are dictionary definitions. I've been thinking a lot about these words lately in relation to Easter and the eyewitnesses to Jesus' appearances after the resurrection and also to the Derek Chauvin trial, and now the killing of Dante Wright, and the charging of the police officer for shooting him with manslaughter. I'm sure there were both bystanders and witnesses at both killings, and the Gospels tell of post-resurrection appearances and of seeing an empty tomb and evidence that a body had been there, but no witnesses or bystanders to the actual resurrection itself. 
That's the interesting thing. Nobody was there at the time he rose. So today I want to ask, what difference is there between a bystander and a witness? Witnesses are called to testify. Bystanders don't want to get involved. You and I, are we bystanders or witnesses to either of these things? I ask this because for a long time now, privileged, well-educated, white-meaning, well-meaning white people, like you perhaps, and like me, have thought of ourselves in relation both to Jesus and to the murder of black and brown people as bystanders. That's whom we have been, who we have preferred to be. Just onlookers, but not involved. And hoping we don't get called as witnesses. Certainly, we think of ourselves as powerless to do anything about what's happening. We remove ourselves from consideration as witnesses by saying we didn't see anything, or we don't know enough about what really happened, or that we're sure there's a part of the story that we aren't aware of. We don't want to be quoted by the news, or have our words entered as evidence, or even remember what we saw and heard, much less trust our sentence senses. I mean, have you ever thought about how the tendency is for us to try to forget what happened instead of deal with it? To claim bystanderhood is to seek safety. To allow ourselves to witness is to become participants in what happened. You see the difference? I mean, to witness in the religious sense to Jesus or the resurrection is to open ourselves to having to speak of what we believe and maybe even to justify or defend it. And I don't know about you, but the people I grew up with in my church didn't want to enter into debate about Jesus or God or the resurrection with each other, much less another religious person who had no qualms about witnessing. My town was filled with people who would go to battle religiously with other people. And the way that my congregation distinguished ourselves was by not entering into that debate. That was just too anxiety producing. So often we sought to be bystanders to things like the resurrection. But to move from bystander to witness status is to recognize our involvement and our participation in the wonder and fear of an empty tomb and a real resurrected body that we can't explain, or the horror of yet another black body killed, which we also cannot explain. But a shift is happening, I think. Partly it's the result of this, a smartphone that can take video of a crime as it happens and then post it on social media where it goes viral. This has turned bystanders into witnesses. And everybody who views the viral video becomes a witness too. And so now, here we are, where a police shooting of a black man has another, as another statistic and a lamentable fact of life becomes a real witnessing of the cycle that repeats itself again and again and disturbs us to our core, involves us as witnesses, and can either lead us down the familiar alley of despair at the fact that it keeps happening again and again and we don't seem to be able to address it, or it can usher us onto the untrodden road that leads to something different than the same old outcome. I want to read you the psalm appointed for this third Sunday of the Easter season, Psalm 4. And I want you to imagine yourself as the one who is speaking, as one who is involved and not as a bystander. Imagine yourself saying these words. Answer me when I call, O God of my right. You gave me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me now and hear my prayer. How long, you people, shall my honor suffer shame? 
How long will they love vain words, these people, and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself. The Lord hears when I call. So when you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder it on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, Oh, that we might see some good. Let the light of your face shine on us, O God. You have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and wine abound. I shall both lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me lie down in safety. In our quest for something to boost our spirits late in this long pandemic, it's tempting to shortcut to resurrection to just jump over the suffering and bypass it. And that's why the Dante Wright killing coming two weeks into the Derek Chauvin trial feels like an intrusion, like pouring salt into a wound that is still gaping, jagged and still bleeding. We wanna put a resurrection band-aid on top of it to stop the bleeding. And yet, as we know from Luke's story of Jesus appearing to the disciples, they touched fresh wounds as physical proof of his body that was broken but raised. They were involved. They were witnesses. As I cast about for what to say this week about hope in the midst of Dante's death, I came up empty at first. All I could recall was two incidents my wife told me about from two work meetings she had led this week. One was from someone who had been leaving the church building that was across the street in Brooklyn Center from where Dante's killing was happening on Sunday, as it happened. And she recalled witnessing Officer Kim Potter's apparent horror at what she had just done as she fell to the ground after shooting Wright. The other was words spoken by my wife's colleague in public health in the other meeting on Tuesday, who happened to be Dante Wright's cousin. She said, it doesn't matter what we do. She was referring, of course, to the fact that it doesn't matter whether black and brown people do everything right or everything wrong whether they obey the law to a T or flee a police officer, whether they speak truth in peace at a candlelight vigil or burn a precinct building in rage and protest. It doesn't matter what we do with the implication that nothing is ever going to change. But the message of the resurrection is not found in winning the debate about how an actual physical body could have risen from an actual stone grave. This is not an academic argument. It is not found in two bystanders or even two groups of bystanders making the empirical case for how it could all have happened, how and in what way we are to believe that the resurrection was an actual event. That debate will never be won especially if it's not if it's waged by bystanders. In order to even wade into that argument, we need to be witnesses, you and me. And in order to be people making a difference, we cannot be bystanders when a black man or a black woman gets shot, or even when they get stopped for a traffic stop. We need witnesses. We need you and me. People willing to go on record as being down for Dante and George and Brianna and Ahmad Arbery and Sandra Bland and Philando and Michael Brown and down for Jesus, whose broken body stands in that room with the disciples as they touch the blood and the tissue and the truth of what happened. A truth that can set us free from the lie of pretending everything is all right when we know it is not. 
Jesus' first words when he appears to them in that room are, peace be with you. And his last words are, you are witnesses of these things. What more do you and I need to hear to stop being bystanders and claim our witnesshood? Amen. As we lift up the names of those in our community who are in need of special care and attention and prayer, we also lift up these words from the poet Jan Richardson in her poem entitled, Blessed Are You Who Bear the Light. Blessed are you who bear the light in unbearable times, who testify to its endurance amid the unendurable who bear witness to its persistence when everything seems in shadow and grief. Blessed are you in whom the light lives, in whom the brightness blazes, your heart a chapel, an altar where in the deepest night can be seen the fire that shines forth in you, in unaccountable faith, in stubborn hope, in love that illumines every broken thing it finds. And now may we join together in prayer using the New Zealand Lord's Prayer that is printed in this morning's bulletin. Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver, Source of all that is and that shall be, Father and mother of us all, loving God, in whom is heaven. The hallowing of your name echo through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and testing, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. There is lots going on in this Easter season. Check out the tab more than usual even. Read it. This coming Saturday, the 24th, is our Mandala event, outdoors in the parking lot, weather permitting, a community art project that you don't want to miss being a part of. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, you still have time to assemble your materials and make a mandala. 
Take a look at Carly's video on YouTube. The link is posted in the tab this week. And make or finish your own mandala this week to be shared in a special event on Saturday, the 24th at 2 o'clock. The night before this, on Friday the 23rd, is Ling Blumston's annual Spring Gala, which is held vi uh, virtually again this year, starting at 7 p.m. That's this coming Friday night. Help our partner in elder care raise funds to support Second Half with Ling Blumston. Details are in the tab. And finally, I want to let you know that I'm going to be on continuing education leave this Tuesday through the weekend. That's the 20th through the 25th. It's a virtual conference, so I'm going to be doing it from home. And if there's an emergency, text or call me on my cell phone and I can respond. I'm just not going to be coming into the office or doing work. I'm taking continuing education time. Carly will be in charge of next Sunday's worship service, so you have the treat of listening to her preach a sermon again. Thanks, Carly. And now comes the time when we recall all that God has done and is doing in our lives. And note that throughout the Easter season, we look for all the different ways and places where Jesus shows up. And we become part of how he appears to the world through what we say and do. We become his hands and feet in many real ways. Now through May, that means our Holy Hammers offering to fund this year's build, and you can give online. And you can also go online to volunteer, to sign up for a shift and volunteer to work a day on the job site. Thank you for giving generously, for being Christ's hands and feet, and living abundantly and joyously. Please pray with me. God of abundant love, we offer a portion of our time, spiritual gifts, and resources as signs of our love for you and the world. Receive our thanks and bless our collective offering to be an expression of healing that brings hope to a hurting world. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.